Hello and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness, your narrator. Well, it's Thanksgiving, the time to reflect on what we're thankful for in life. And for me, it's you, my listeners. I appreciate every single one of you. But since tonight's stories revolve around the medical profession, I'd like to give an extra special shout out to the Dell Soul listening crew. They're a group of medical professionals working the night shift who take their breaks together every Thursday to listen to this humble floating eyeball read scary stories. I invite all of my listeners to post a word of thanks to medical professionals around the world who are on the front lines taking care of us every day. And now, it's time to put on those stretchy Thanksgiving feast eaten pants, sit back, relax, let me lead the way. And let's get scared together, 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 together. I'm a doctor at a hospital in Colorado, and I have two stories to tell. Story number one. I work in a hospital with a big burn unit. People are flown in from five states around. There was this one Native American man that had been in the same room for several months. He had been in a terrible fire and around 75% of his body had been burned. Keep in mind, that meant every single day they had to wash out his burns and he was getting surgeries. It was all very painful. Well, the poor guy eventually died after months of this torture. Shortly thereafter, very weird electrical things started happening in his room. Some of it I personally witnessed. Lights would go on and off by themselves. The TV would suddenly turn on at full blast, and we couldn't turn it off. And the phone would ring, but when you'd answer, there would only be this weird static on the other end. When this stuff would happen, the RNs would go into his room, say his name out loud, and then say, Knock it off. And I swear to God, every single time, whatever was happening would suddenly stop. For months after this guy died, every single patient that stayed in that room claimed to see a Native American man in there. It got so bad that the hospital administration called in a Native American shaman from this guy's tribe so that he could cleanse the room. We had a ceremony and everything. And after that, none of it ever happened again. This second story really creeps me out because it happened to me personally. I was working on call at a different hospital. The room where the staff sleeps during on call is an old repurposed ICU room. I was in there asleep at 5 a.m. The nurses would sometimes pop their heads in the room even if they didn't need me. So to stop that, I barricaded the door with a trash can and a copy of Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. It's a 5,000 page book. So combined with the trash can, It was heavy enough to stop people from randomly opening the door and waking me up. I was just drifting off when the door opened and someone walked in. I had the strong feeling that it was female for some reason. Anyway, it walked over to where I was, leaned over, and hissed in my ear the worst sound that I've ever heard in my life. It sounded like an Aztec death whistle. Here's what that sounds like. totally freaked me out. But I passed it off as just a night terror until I realized that the door that I had closed and barricaded was now pushed all the way open and the trash can and book were being used as a doorstop. I never slept in that room again. Almost everybody who works the night shift at a hospital has a ghost story or two but they aren't likely to tell you because it makes them seem like they're crazy. I work in the ER, and once I was taking care of a six-year-old girl who fell from a tree and had a very significant head injury. She wasn't responding to voice commands or painful stimuli but she seemed to be having a conversation with someone that none of us could see. 
Most of it I couldn't hear, but the only part that I did make out was when she said, Well, I know, but I don't want to be dead. Then she became unresponsive. Happily, the neurosurgeon was able to get to her in time, and he stopped the epidural bleed. She survived with only mild side effects, and she came to see us after she was discharged, but she had no memory of this phantom conversation at all. My mom was a night nurse at a burn unit in Dallas, Texas. She was always told that the burn unit was supposedly haunted, but she was never sure whether to believe this or not, until a little girl came into the unit with horrific burns. This girl's parents couldn't stay with her at night, so my mom would make a point to check on her pretty often when she worked the overnight shift. During one shift, my mom asked the girl if she ever got scared during the night. The girl said, no, I don't because an old lady always comes to read to me every night, and she sits by my bed until I fall asleep. Well, this shocked my mom, because there were no older women working in the burn unit, and she was often the only one on the night shift. She always recalls this as one of the craziest things that ever happened to her as a healthcare worker. I'm a psychiatric nurse, and early in my career, I worked at a residential mental health facility. There was a resident I'll call Mark Duchesne. He was an elective mute. That simply means that he wouldn't talk, but there was no pathological reason as to why. He had spoken earlier in life, and with the notable exception of being nearly seven feet tall, he seemed on the outside to be rather normal. Mark had been raised in the Deep South and joined the military when he was just 19. After boot camp, he was stationed in the South. And one night, he just up and vanished. He was listed as AWOL for years. Then finally, he was declared missing and presumed dead. 10 years later, a seven foot tall man walked into the VA hospital in my part of the Midwest and said to the receptionist, my name is Mark Duchesne, and I have been dead for 10 years. Those were the last words he ever spoke. When he came in there, he was covered in dust, and he was wearing the same clothes that he was reported to be wearing when he went missing 10 years earlier. In all those years, his social security number had never been used, and he had no ID on his person. However, they were able to identify him through his fingerprints. He was well fed and in very good health, except for his absolute refusal to speak. But when they notified his family, they said that they had already grieved the man they lost, and whomever was claiming to be him simply couldn't be. They said it was a haint, a stand-in for their dead relative, and they demanded to never be contacted again. A haint is an old southern term for a specific type of ghost, an evil spirit that this man's family was convinced had taken over their loved one's life and was living it for him. Mark paced all day, every day. Not in a frantic way, but he just lumbered up and down the halls and outside. He smiled all the time, and he would move his mouth to indicate that he was talking but not a sound came out. It would be dead silent. Not a sound escaped his mouth, ever. He had a very unnerving habit of throwing his head back with his mouth wide open as if he were laughing heartily, but not even a breath could be heard. If told to go to the dining room for a meal, he'd go and eat. But if nobody told him, he'd just keep pacing never indicating hunger, ever. If offered a cigarette, he'd smoke it, but he'd do it in a very oddly formal way, almost delicately, 
if that makes any sense. But he never seemed to crave smoking. The man wanted nothing. If spoken to, he appeared to listen, and periodically he'd throw his head back in that weird laughing mimicking way of his. But there was nothing to do for this man. Various medications were tried, but they didn't have an effect on him one way or the other. Therapy did nothing because all Mark would do was grin. And unless told to stay put, he'd just get up and start pacing again. All day, every day, pacing. My final day at that job, on my way to the car, the last thing I ever saw was Mark pacing in the parking lot, throwing his head back to laugh. Driving away, I wondered if all that time I'd been dealing with a ghost. All these years later, I still don't know. I work as a nurse in a psych ward in an old hospital. I'm on the night shift, and normally the most exciting thing that we deal with is trying to convince patients to go back to bed. The staff normally sits in the corridor at the intersection between the male and female sides of the ward. We can hear everything that's going on better from that area and can intervene faster if need be. There's a shower room just to the left of where we sit. It has a toilet and a short wall separating the shower in the far corner of the room. As we were sitting there, the door to the shower room slowly crept open. No big deal. We got up, closed it, and went right on with our night. It happened again about an hour later, and we again thought nothing of it. After closing the door the second time, though, we heard the sound of running water. I went in and found the shower was on. I figured the handle was broken, but when I tried to turn it, it spun easily and the water shut off, so it wasn't broken. A little freaked out now, I peeked around the partition of the shower in case a patient was there hiding, but no one was there. As I turned to walk out, I felt a sudden chill on the back of my neck and I heard a hissing sound behind me. I again checked the shower, but everything seemed to be fine. The next night, we were all sitting in the same place again, and it was again a pretty quiet night. Until around 2 a.m., when we heard a massive bang, then a dull thud, as if someone had hit the wall, then slid to the floor. The noise seemed to be coming from close by, so we each looked through the patient's rooms, expecting to find that one of them had fallen. But everyone was sound asleep except for one patient who told us that she'd been having trouble sleeping for the past few nights and asked if she could watch some TV in the sitting room. We told her yes, and we continued our search, but we didn't find anything to explain that sound. Then we sat back down and started joking about the place being haunted. The patient watching TV then asked if she could smoke in the bathroom. We occasionally let people do this at night because trying to tell an avid smoker that they can't have a cigarette is a surefire way to start a fight that will wake up the whole ward. We told her she could have a quick one in the shower room before going back to bed, and she asked one of us to come with her. When we asked why, she said, Because that room freaks me out. There are spirits trying to come through the mirrors. Now, it's a psych ward, so we've heard stuff like that from patients on a regular basis, and we didn't think much of it, so I agreed to go with her. While in there, she talked about seeing the ghost of a man in her room, and that was what was keeping her up at night. She then stopped talking abruptly and looked around, confused. Then, she slowly peered around the shower partition wall. I asked her what was wrong, and she shushed me then asked in a whisper if I heard what she heard. I told her that I didn't hear anything, but again, it's common for people in the psych ward to have auditory hallucinations. But out of curiosity, I asked her what she heard. She said she heard running water, but there was no water running. And when she checked behind the partition, she said that she heard a hissing sound. 
I suggested that she finish her cigarette and get back to bed. Then she asked for some medication to calm her down and said, Man, I hate this bathroom. The door opens and closes by itself, you know. After she went back to bed, I was telling the other staff all this, and we laughed about what a freaky coincidence it all was. We were still discussing it when the day staff came in. When the first day nurse arrived, she asked us how the shift went, and we asked her, in a joking way, if she believed in ghosts. She said no, but that she had some very bad memories about being on this particular ward that still freaked her out. She then told us that the worst thing she ever saw was 20 years ago. While doing the hourly checks of the ward, she couldn't find one patient, and she looked in the shower room because she could hear that water was running. She looked around the partition and found the guy lying dead in a pool of his own blood. He had committed suicide in the shower. This nurse then told us that ever since it happened, a few times she's gone into that shower room and felt a sudden cold rush of air against her neck, as if someone were trying to get past her. Well, things didn't stop there. The next night, I was sitting watch at the very end of the corridor, with my back to the fire door. The door has a small glass window at the top. This place is what we call the observation seat, because you could see everything that was happening, and we all take turns sitting in that seat throughout the night. I was talking with one of the nurses, and she looked behind me, confused. I asked her what was going on, and she said she thought she saw something moving on the other side of the fire door. That door leads outside to the garbage bins in the back of the building. I told her to stop creeping me out, and we just laughed it off. Then we started talking about other things, when once again, she looked up, startled. She said this time she was positive that she saw something move past that glass, and she dared me to go look outside. I was about to tell her, oh, hell no, when we heard a loud thud on the other side of the door, as if someone had kicked it. We froze in terror as we then heard a very gentle knock on the door. We forced ourselves to look out that window, but there was nothing there. Well, a few hours later, someone else was sitting observation, and I was in the middle of the hallway talking to another nurse, when she looked up and gasped. She pointed at the fire door and swore that she had seen the pale face of a woman staring through that window. Then it disappeared. At that point, a patient came stumbling out of her room, still half asleep, and ran right past the nurse sitting observation and straight down the corridor towards us. She looked terrified and confused. We thought that she was sleepwalking, so we caught her and tried to soothe her, but she kept trying to push past us, the whole time muttering in a scared voice, There's someone there. There's someone there. There's someone there. We were finally able to calm her down and took her back to her room. But when we got there, she asked us why we had a nurse standing over her the whole night. We assured her that no one had been standing over her at all. And she looked around, even more confused. She said that there had been a woman standing over her the entire night. But we managed to settle her down and she fell asleep. A bit later, another nurse stepped out of the office behind us and looked up and said in a panicked voice, Who is that? She said she glanced up at the fire door and saw the face of a pale blonde woman pressed up against the window. It may be time to start looking for a new job. My aunt is a nurse, and she's told me quite a few stories, but this one has really stuck with me. There was an old lady who insisted on being strapped down to her bed every night. She told my aunt and the other nurses that there was a dark figure who was trying to grab her and drag her out of her room, and if he succeeded in doing so, 
she would die. My aunt and the other nurses humored her, and for the next few days, they did as she asked, and they strapped her down. But my aunt said that when she would go to check on this lady during the night, it did look as though something was trying to pull her from her bed. She said it was the damnedest thing. Then, my aunt had a night off, and the other nurse on duty didn't strap the lady down that night. The next morning, they found that old lady lying face down on the floor, her hand stretched out past the door into the hallway, dead. My sister's stepson was in a very bad accident. We all gathered at the ICU before he passed, and I went in with my sister and her two young children. They both fell apart seeing their brother in such a bad way. The decision had already been made to take him off life support, so they were just letting the family say our final goodbyes. My niece and nephew were afraid to go to the bedside. I told them that this would be the very last time that they would ever get to see their brother and it was their final chance to say goodbye. So they let me take their hands and we walked up together to his bedside to say our goodbyes. Later that night, after he passed, I was driving home and as clear as if he were sitting right next to me, I heard him thank me for giving him the chance to say goodbye to his brother and sister. I told him he was welcome. My mom worked for a hospital that shut down around 15 years ago. They were having a sort of farewell party for staff and family. Towards the end of the party, she, my sister, and I took a walk around the inside of the building to just take a last look. We went to the fourth floor and we were the only people up there. As we walked down the hallway, we heard footsteps that sounded just like men's dress shoes walking right next to us. The footsteps were pretty loud and they sounded very different from the sound that our sneakers were making. And when we stopped walking, the footsteps kept going. Once they reached the end of the hallway, the emergency light and the alarm by the room where they stopped began ringing. My mom went over there, but she couldn't shut it off because the system was already disconnected. I think she tried really hard to keep it together for our sake because all she did was say, Hmm, huh, well, that's weird. It's already disconnected. But I do remember that we noped it out of there pretty darn fast. And when we got to the elevator, the button for the ground floor was already pushed for us. I work in a pediatric hospital and I had always heard that the fourth floor, right outside of our oncology unit, was haunted. I normally work day shifts, but once in a while I would pick up a night shift. So one night I was working there, and I happened to be on the fourth floor, but on the opposite side. The oncology unit had a staircase that was used as a shortcut to get to the cafeteria on the second floor. At 3 a.m. I was ready to take my break, and I wanted a cup of coffee from the cafeteria, so I took the staircase. I walked through the double doors, and I saw a little kid skipping down the hallway. I called out to him, afraid that some kid had snuck out of his room. As soon as he heard my voice, he turned to look at me, and when he did, he completely vanished. A lot of the other doctors and nurses have claimed to see this same skipping child, of course, I chalked it up to just being exhausted, although I've never used that hallway again.
I'm a student nurse, and I once had a patient say, If you ever feel a chill whenever you're working at the computer, don't worry. It's just a nurse who used to work here a long, long time ago. She doesn't understand technology, and she's trying to learn. And I do always feel like somebody is looking over my shoulder when I'm on the computer. So this really freaked me out. I used to work in a nursing home, so most of our patients died within a few years of being with us. I had a female patient die, and a new woman moved into her room a few days later. This new woman kept hitting the call button every night, saying that there was a lady who kept coming into her room trying to talk to her. At first, I just passed it off as her being in her 90s and having dementia. I told her that I would lock her door at night making sure that nobody would come in. But after a week of this continuing to happen, I sat down with her and I asked her what this lady looked like, thinking she was just hallucinating. She told me that the woman had on a pink robe with blue fuzzy slippers and curlers in her hair. She said the lady would come in, sit at the foot of her bed, pat her feet, and try to talk to her, but she couldn't make out what she was saying. When I heard that, a chill went up my spine. The woman who had died just the week earlier in that very room went to bed every night with a pink robe, blue fuzzy slippers, and curlers in her hair. I had a patient once on the acute ward of a very busy hospital who was a psychic medium. She had suffered a stroke which affected her mobility and she was with us for a long time. She was a lot of fun and would give readings to the staff from time to time. I never took it all very seriously until one evening. She pressed her call buzzer and told us to go check on a patient in another room because he had died. We went to look and sure enough, the man was dead. Later on, we asked our psychic patient how she had known that the man had died. She said that she saw him coming out of his room, obviously confused and distressed, and not knowing that he was dead. She had to explain to him what had happened, and she helped him cross over to the light. Now, I'm not a believer, but that gave me the creeps. Well, I trust that those stretchy pants are bursting at the seams from your Thanksgiving feast and you're in a food coma, barely coherent at the moment. I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's video and that you had a wonderful holiday. Thank you so much for spending part of your day with me. I appreciate it more than you know. Now it's time for you to fall into a dreamless, turkey-fueled sleep, the Del Sol listening crew to get back to work, and stop ignoring their patients, and for me to begin planning my next video. So, until next time, stay scared, my friends.